So let's get straight into the first tip I have for you. Often we're streetscapes. We draw them because we love the architecture, we love the buildings, but often drawing people is not our strong point, which is why we draw streetscapes and don't do figure drawing. So I want to give a couple of tips about small gestural drawings of people, the sort of thing we would use just to populate our streets so it doesn't look like some weird zombie apocalypse has happened. What I often see in these sorts of figures is something that looks like this. So my first point is if we're drawing heads, don't draw circles. Draw a shape that looks a bit more like a head. If we're looking two thirds on, then we tend to have a straighter side that goes down in the neck and a rounded side. If we're looking straight on, then it could be more symmetrical. Obviously it depends a bit on the shape of the person. And then we can always add some hair on top. We can put ears. It, look, it really depends how much detail we want to put in our faces. But I'm assuming most of these figures will be small enough that we probably accept possibly hair won't put any. Of course, if we're doing a three quarter head, we need to adjust any suggestion of features accordingly. But most of the time, except perhaps for placing hair on one of these heads, I don't do much at all. If I'm drawing a lady, that's a really easy haircut to make it reasonably clear. First tip with drawing people, the shape of the head. The second problem I often see is that the head is placed directly onto the line that represents the top of the shoulders. What I find works a lot better is to remember the neck, but not to actually draw the neck because that's a bit of an awkward thing to draw, particularly in a small scale and to get right. I find I generally just leave the gap and that works really well. Of course, I'm not generally drawing my figures this large. But see how that sits happily. And of course, if it's winter, we can always use that space to pop a scarf in. My next suggestion in drawing figures is to have a clear sense if they're walking or standing still. If they're walking, it's to have a clear sense of the sense of direction they're walking in. This gentleman is walking. And my tip then is to use knowledge of the direction that they're walking in to make shorter the leg which is off the ground if we've caught them mid stride. And if we're drawing a number of people who are walking on a busy street, some of them at least we will capture with one leg off the ground. The easiest way to do it is to have the front leg striding forward and have the leg going backwards off the ground. But of course it can work both ways. The back leg can be flat on the ground and the front leg can be not yet touching the ground. The other thing is to make sure that we make our hands long enough. Our hands actually come down to some point on our thighs. Although of course if the arms are bent, then that will change how far down they come. So we're just wanting to suggest figures really. And the further back we go, of course, the less detail we need to put in. And we can sometimes use hair to show whether they're coming to us or walking away from us. So in these quick gestural drawings of pedestrians in our streets, we want to make sure that we draw something that suggests the shape of a head and not a circle. We want to leave room for a neck, however we draw the body. And when we draw legs, we want to indicate with a different height that the person's legs are not both on the ground at the same time, unless they are. My second tip in drawing streetscapes is a technique I have found really helpful in preventing a lot of frustration with one particular type of mistake. So let's say we're doing a streetscape. There's a spire, maybe it's a church, maybe it's a town hall or some decorative building. So we have a spire. And we want to put the spire on top of the tower. And I've exaggerated probably most people's mistakes in doing this, but this is what can happen. And suddenly our spire either looks lopsided or else it looks like it's leaning and it's going to 
fall over one way. And because these structures are often silhouetted against a horizon, it can be really frustrating if it's one of the last things we've drawn. So the technique I use in drawing spires is this. What I do is I position where the base of the spire is going to be. And I look and I work out where is the tip of the spire going to be in terms of being over this tower. Now looking straight onto the tower, it's pretty obviously going to be in the middle. But we may have to give a little more consideration if this is a side on perspective view and we can see two sides of the tower, particularly if we're not seeing the same amount of each side. What I do is I work out where the center of the tower spire is going to be, which is I want it to be in the center. And then I also work out how high it needs to be. And I do the point. And now the only decision is do I draw the lines up or down? And in my experience, it's better to start at the top and draw down. And the reason I do that is because if I don't get it quite right, as is the case here, then I can often play around with it a bit and make it look a little more correct. But if the tip's in the wrong place, I can't play around with it at all. And so I find that drawing from the top down and ensuring that I get the tip of the spire in the right place gives me a little wiggle room if it doesn't line up exactly. And you might not think it from a quick look at my artwork. I know I often need that wiggle room just to make slight adjustments so that it looks correct because the brain will favor a line that's in the right place and see it more clearly than something in the wrong place. And so if the tip of our spire is nicely centered, that will be a more dominant feature in our mind as we look at this scene than exactly what's happening with a few multiple lines here. And of course, often spires actually have molding on the spire corners as well. So we can often disguise any slight imperfections here as part of the decorative elements of the way that spire is put together. My third tip for drawing streetscapes concerns a really common situation that we find ourselves in when we draw. Let me show you. We draw a building. Now in front of this building though, we have a lamppost. And it's pretty dark, so we figure we can pop it in like this. But I would suggest a better way of constructing this scene, and again, it's looking at the order in which we do things, is to draw the lamppost first. Let me show you the difference. Okay, so here's a very quick gestural lamppost, and now we put the building in behind it. This sort of effect is a subtle difference, but it's to do with creating a very slight gap with some of our line work and some of our hatching work around objects so that visually we can distinguish them more even at a subconscious level. And by drawing the foreground items first, we can plan the things behind so that we leave this slight visual gap. And I find this helps create a sense of depth. It lets this lamppost sit forward a little more easily than this one does. Which, although because the base is lower than the base of the building, we know it's closer. If we hide that visual clue, the right hand lamp, I think, feels like it's forward in a way that the left hand one doesn't. Of course, if we'd had some street furniture, such as a garden bench or a bus stop in front of the lamp, the same thing would happen. We would leave a slight gap where the third object cut in front. The more complex our scene is, the more valuable this technique I find is. My fourth tip when we're drawing streetscapes is in the situation where we have a facade of a building or maybe of many buildings that slope away from us down the street. And so we have nice perspective angles reducing the height of the buildings as they move further away. Now, in this sort of situation, one thing that I find really important to remember, particularly when we have a row of features, 
that are all identical or near identical, such as windows, is to reduce the detail and to draw with a lighter touch as we move further into the distance. Let me show you. So we're going to put our row of windows between these lines. So here's a very quick gestural drawing of a row of windows that have minimal detail, but I've still included the detail of the fact that these windows are divided in two vertically. There's some timber stripping inside the window frames and there's a vertical division between them. And if you notice, you'll see that while our vertical divisions are definitely three dimensional with depth in the first few, at some point they become two and then just one single line. The detail, and if you like, almost the care with which we put the hatching behind the windows also reduces as the windows move further away. Our lines become more gestural and less exact. And this all reflects the fact that we see things less clearly and is less precise the further away they move. So we're seeking to imitate in our line work the effect of objects moving further away. We start to suggest the detail up here with a very minimum number of lines which we draw more exactly here. And it's a very important aspect in my drawing of helping to create a sense of distance. So drawing objects with less detail and a lighter touch even when they're identical objects in life helps create a sense of distance and is a great technique whenever we're doing a streetscape, particularly where the street is moving away from us. My fifth point is also to do with an area of streetscapes, which in my observation is often an area of weakness in drawings. Let me show you. So here we have a small building sitting on the ground. But what if we drew it like this? And here we have our second house. And the one difference I've made And the one difference I've made intentionally is instead of having these firm straight lines along the bottom of the building, I've deliberately chosen to put a broken line, broken in a very irregular way, to help indicate the fact that where most buildings touch the ground, it's not a smooth straight line. There's asphalt and gravel or grass or things coming up against the building that stop it being a smooth line. And if I'm trying to inject a sense of realism in my drawing, it's one of a number of ways that we can do that. I think it's common to put these straight lines in early because it's, we're defining the shape of the building. And this is obviously a very important part of doing that. But if we can at least draw these lines lightly, in effect do dotted lines that we join some of the dots up later, I think it creates a greater sense of realism in our finished drawing. What do you think? G'day, I'm Stephen Travers. I hope you found these tips helpful and to some benefit as you continue to develop streetscape drawing. Hey, if you haven't subscribed yet, it's not too late. Hit the subscribe button, even notifications and tell your friends if you think my channel is useful. Keep drawing, have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.